I'd like to welcome everybody and welcome Abby Schwartz for a return engagement <laughs> back by popular demand. Um, and just a brief introduction. Abby is the director of the um, Skirball Museum at HUC. I think everybody knows that. Um, but before that, she was the uh, curator of education at the Taft Museum uh, of Art, and she's lectured widely on Jewish art in the Melton School and at the Ali program at, um, at UC. And uh, while she was at the Taft, she served as a general editor for the publication Artistic Expressions of Faith in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, and that was the first place winner of the 1998 Ohio Museums Association Visual Communications Award. Uh, and uh, so with that, I think I'll let Abby start her, her program. Thank you so much, Bobby. Can everyone hear me? Just nod. Yes. Yep. Yes. So, um, and uh, if you have a question or a comment, you can put it in the chat. Or if you feel it's urgent, I'm. <laughs> I don't mind being interrupted. I won't lose my place. So um, feel free. And but if you're not speaking, it's really best if you mute yourself because that really helps with the sound and the delivery of the. Of the video. I'm not sure why that is, but um, just please uh, turn, do mute yourself and I'll begin. Um, so this, the topic for today is take 10, a close look at modern Israeli art. And the reason that it's not going to be 10 minutes, <laughs> but it is going to be um, 10 works of art that um, we're going to talk about as well as some other works of art that help inform those 10 works of art. But the reason that there's the number 10 here is that a uh, couple of years ago, we were invited to apply to be uh, the recipients of a gift from a collection of Nancy Berman and Alan Block. So Nancy Berman was the director of what was the Skirball Museum in Los Angeles before it separated from HUC and became what it is today, the Skirball Cultural Center. Um, so she, and she knew um, lots of the people who were in the leadership uh, in, at HUC in Cincinnati, as well as the fledgling uh, museum on the campus of HUC back in those years uh, in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s. And so she, someone on her behalf reached out to me and said, we're, we're offering this opportunity to just a few institutions. Um, and if you submit an application, you might end up with a portion of this wonderful collection of modern Israeli art from uh, Nancy and her husband Alan. It actually really was her Nancy's parents' uh, collection who made, uh, you know, really made an effort to grow a collection of some of the great Israeli modernists. Um, mo almost all uh, works on paper. There's one oil. And these names, while they might not be real, real familiar to most people, when people who know Jewish art and Israeli art look at this list, um, it would be like having, getting a collection of 10 works on paper by uh, John Singer Sargent, Edward Hopper, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, Jackson Pollock. I mean, so these are big, big names in the history of Israeli modern art. So we applied and, um, it, they ended up, there ended up being three institutions that really rose to the top. And we were gifted these 10 works of art, these nine watercolors and works on paper, a couple of lithographs and one oil. There are nine artists. One of the artists represented has two works that we were given. So these entered our collection. And out of that, I grew this talk, which I've given uh, a few different times. And actually, uh, one of the works, or maybe even two of the works that I'm going to just briefly talk about today, we're going to take a much closer look at um, in the fall. I'm going to be back again to do one of the Elul programs. 
and we're going to get really into it in terms of um, conversation and discussion and actually some art making. So just a plug, stay tuned because I'll be back yet again. And a couple of the works in this presentation will be uh, a focus of that. So what I like to do be before I introduce these very modern artists, um, when I say modern, it means that they were active um, in the, from the about 1950, 1960 to uh, the turn of the 21st century. So uh, that's kind of where we, we consider modern art to be. Um, and, but I like to always take a look, a little bit of a look back uh, to see what the what what was going on in you know before these artists sort of started to make their mark. So if we look at the period of the beginning of the 20th century, we're talking about Palestine under Ottoman rule, and of course, actually even before the beginning of the 20th century, the late 19th century, people were going Jewish people were coming to Palestine. Um, they were, it was a haven for newcomers. It was a land of immigrants. There was an uncrystallized culture with no art traditions, no museums, no academies, no institutions to transmit an artistic heritage from generation to generation. So it was into this milieu that Lithuanian born Boris Schatz, who lived from 1867 to 1932, arrived in Palestine in 1906. He had proposed a Jewish art school at the Fifth Zionist Congress in 1905, the year before. So here's somebody who's coming from Eastern Europe, committed to creating a, an art school in Palestine that would train artists to make not only works of art, but it was really sort of based on the industrial arts model of the Victoria and Albert Museum that the things that people could make would actually be utilitarian. They would be beautiful as well, but the idea was that, you know, these were this was these were all people who needed things. They need ta needed tables, they needed lamps, they needed uh, you know, vases and you know all kinds of objects that they could create a school and it was initially called the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts and it was founded in 1906, and it took the name of Betzalel ben Uri, who is the artisan from the Book of Exodus who devised the tabernacle in the wilderness to transport the tablets of the law to the promised land. So all of that is explained in the Book of Exodus, chapter 31, verses 2 through 11. So the opening of the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts marked the onset of applied cultural Zionism in the land of Israel and heralded efforts to really forge links between a lot of different Jewish artistic traditions, those from the East, you know, and the, the indigenous area that Palestine occupied and what people brought with them from the West. So Schatz's style in his work, and that you see one of his works here, it's called Sounding the Great Shofar. And this is a work that's in the collection of the Skirball. Um, it was very old world, very traditional, very nostalgic for the shtetl life and the traditional customs and rituals of Jewish life in Eastern Europe. Now, um, Another work in the Skirball's collection that, again, is reminiscent of this, uh, this tradition of sort of bringing what they knew from the old country is a work also in the Skirball's collection by Lazar Creston. Uh, it is, you know, Hasid studying. And actually, one of the things that Schatz is really credited with is bringing many of the first artists to Palestine, including Zev Rabban, E.M. Lillian, Herman Struck, and Lazar Creston, whose work you see here. Uh, we also have works in, in the Skirball's collection by Zev Rabban and E.M. Lillian as well. So this sort of represented that early group of artists who were still very traditional. 
So now we move quickly to the 1920s. Betzalel had evolved from a small school for arts and crafts teachers and an outlet for home industries into a complex of workshops that produced art objects and an art school with high artistic standards. But what started to happen in the 1920s is that, is that there were modernist trends that were starting to emerge, especially in Tel Aviv, uh, not to mention the direction of contemporary European art at the time. So the 1920s are the period when all of the modern masters uh, like Picasso and Matisse, you know, their, their reputations are being formed and, you know, the young artists were really attracted to that. So by 1923, a younger, more modern group had control of the school, a group that wanted to see a very specifically national art evolve, but not one that was looking back over its shoulders to the ghettos of Eastern Europe. So they wanted to leave that behind. So what happens? And, the, and perhaps the best known pioneer of what we refer to today as modern Israeli art is this artist. These are both self-portraits of Reuven Rubin. He lived from 1893 to 1974, and he's often described as Israel's painter laureate. His art was strongly conditioned by the land, the particular landscapes of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Sfat. He also was attracted to the ethnic types, their costumes, the monuments, the archeological remains. This man's name, given name was Ruven Zelakovici, and he belonged to what is called the first generation of Eretz Israel artists who were active between 1906 and 1929. 1929 is sort of a breaking point because that is when the Betzalel school temporarily closed. What happened was there was a growing contingent of artists who were rejecting the uh, academic approach to teaching, the conservatism, and this sort of diaspora mentality that was represented by those early artists who were looking back to the old country. And the school had to reinvent itself and it reopened in 1935 with a very significant shift in aesthetic focus. So Reuven Rubin was sort of part of that movement to change the school and to change the direction of uh, Israeli art. He was born in Romania he was the eighth of 11 children. Uh, he was born into a, a Hasidic family that was not very, didn't have a lot of means. He first came to Ottoman ruled Palestine to study art at Betzalel, but found himself at odds with the artistic views of the teachers. So he left for Paris in 1913. And in Paris, he studied at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts, and by this time, he had started to sign his drawings Reuven in Hebrew and Reuben in Latin characters. So that's how he comes up with this name and really abandons his family name. At the outbreak of World War I, he went back to Romania where he spent the war years. And in 1921, he was able to travel to the United States with another artist. He spent time in New York where he had his first American show at the Anderson Gallery. He then returned to Europe and then he immigrated to Mandate Palestine in 1923. So certainly we're going, we can see in these works, uh, this early self-portrait on the left and later in his life uh, on the right, the influence of what he would have seen in New York and in Paris. Um, but the work that he painted uh, in 1923, just a year after he settled in, or actually in the same year that he settled in, in uh, Palestine, is this very large triptych. This is not one of the paintings that came to us through this gift, but it's important background. Um, it, it, it is a triptych in three parts. Uh, the two wings, depict 
uh, people from the area, indigenous Arabs that were uh, that were part of uh, the the surroundings when he came to Palestine. Uh, on the left, we see a shepherd playing on his flute. He has sheep grazing around him. While on the right, uh, in in a the panel that's called Serenity, the figures sleep in the desert sands between a cactus and a camel. These native dwellers are sort of delicate, very uh, elegant and, and elongated, living in harmony with the land that sort of rises to surround them, to enfold them. Their bodies kind of blend into the curves of the land and they they passively accept what the land provides rather than taking control of it. And of course, what I'm saying here is, you know, our, is commentary that art historians have made over the years about this work. By contrast, the center panel called Fruit of the Land, um, he has just, this has been described and, you know, that he, he did write about his work as well as the Jewish figures who are, part of this story. And they uh, form very strong vertical presence against the rounded hills and they dominate and fill the landscape and the format. So while the others sort of seem to recede into the setting, these figures in the center panel are right up against the picture plane. They really command the space of the center panel. Behind them, there is a field that is planted with seedlings, and we, we understand that as an effort to um, convert the barren hills into fertile lands. We see that these, these Jews are living harmoniously among their Arab neighbors. The, the, this is a, a Yemenite family, um, and this, the couple on the right, are understood as Western pioneers. So all of these different people who made their lives in uh, this land, you know, look a little different, they dress a little bit differently, um, and they are, all, uh, they are all symbolizing something. So the couple on the left um, are identified as Jews because of the man's head covering and his side curls. And their first fruit, as I said, that's what is the center of this uh, panel is called, this piece is called, their, or fruit of the land, their, their first fruit is actually a child. Um, and the, the, the woman, the wife, holds a, pa a pomegranate, which of course is a symbol of fruitfulness and fertility. Um, and this couple on the right, these, these Western pioneers, their fruit is of the earth. The man, very tanned by the sun, uh, but, but very muscular, larger than any of the other figures, carries a melon on one shoulder, as if supporting the world. And he holds a bunch of bananas uh, in front of his wife. Her first fruits are not a child, but the oranges she holds in her hands and in her lap or at her feet in this uh, basket. So this, this triptych form, when I mentioned earlier that one of the things that was going to happen with the developments in, in the Betzalel school was the blending of traditions that they were bringing from, the his, from history and also uh, the, the innovations and the things that they were bringing from their experience of modern art that was going on in Europe and America. So this idea of a triptych form um, really goes all the way back to uh, Byzantine and even Egyptian art. So you see here a religious triptych from the Byzantine period, of course, Christian, but um, the idea of the figures sort of filling the picture plane and very much uh, you know, coming, commanding all of the space and, and large and, and vertical, that is something that would, would have been known by these artists. And also even going all the way back to e ancient Egypt, the, the very flattened sort of simplified planes um, 
are, are very reminiscent of uh, Egyptian art. Another artist who influenced a lot of what Ruben Rubin did was Matisse, and it was it from it from Matisse that he also gathered this sort of flattened flattening of the figures, but also vibrant color. That's not so evident in First Fruits, but you'll see it uh, in another other works by him. So the um, result is this, you know, highly modernized, um, highly simplified modern style, which evokes both associations with a remote Eastern past in terms of the Byzantine art and the Egyptian art and a recognition of what's going on in modern art as well. So the painting that is part now part of the Skirball collection that came um, in this group of 10 works is this one. And I think when I mentioned Matisse, now you can, and showed you that very richly colored canvas, you can see that that, is, uh, that influenced him. And this is late, this is 1972. And the work is called Caesarea. And Caesarea was where Ruben had a home and a studio. And we are looking at a vase in his home, looking out the window toward the sea uh, and sort of combining interior and exterior. And this is very typical of his late work. We might think about someone like Renoir, uh, whose work here is on the right uh, when we think about who might have, who he might have been thinking about and who some of his influences were. So through the open window of his home, dominated by a vase of vibrant flowers, we glimpse the beauty of the ancient city on the Mediterranean coast with its spacious fields, archaeological ruins, even a, a man leading a figure on a donkey, uh, you know, so he's not losing the association with the ancient past and with the um, agricultural nature and, and sort of Bedouin nomad, nomadic nature of this place. Um, so we see it and we even see a glimpse of the sea beyond these ruins. So um, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful explosion of color and um, you know, representative of the late work of this artist who, as I mentioned, was considered the painter laureate of Israel. So as I mentioned, the Betzalel School closed in 1929 and um, artists rejected the conservatism. They were interested in abstraction and, and expressionism. These things were emanating from Paris. And German Expressionism was introduced in the middle of the 1930s with the arrival of immigrants, immigrant artists fleeing Germany and the terror of rising Nazism. And one of the artists who was part of that group was an artist named Mordechai Ardon. And he was born in 1896, he lived until 1992. So um, a very long career. And he was born in Poland. He studied in Munich and Berlin, and he immigrated to Israel in 1933 when the Nazis came to power. And we have uh, two self-portraits from around 1936 of him here on the screen right now. Ardon would go on to serve as director of the Betzalel School when it reopened in 1935, and he held that position until 1952. And it was under his guidance that a whole new generation of artists grew to maturity. His early work is characterized by expressionistic use of pigment applied in thick layers. And it recalls really the structure of works by Cezanne. So the Ardon work is on the left. It's called Cross Valley from 1939. And this is, um, this is not, the work that's in our collect uh, in our show, um, and on the right you see a work by Cezanne of Mont Saint Victoire. Like Cezanne, Ardon returned to the same place over and over again and painted it different times of day under different weather conditions. Um, but with this, you know, we we can still see that there are buildings here 
in both of these artists work, but you know, it's really about the application of the pigment and the way that the different uh, colors and different uh, brush strokes combine with each other to create this um, still recognizable, but very much abstracted landscape. So um, he did really uh, investigate the landscape of Jerusalem and the surrounding hills. He uh, was very much inspired by the mysticism of the Kabbalah, as well as the inventions of contemporary abstract art. So jumping from 1936, to 1973, the work on the left is the work that is now part of our collection. It's called To the Morning Star. And on the right, again, I, I've put another uh, Cezanne because I can't, I don't think you can escape the affinity uh, between the way that uh, paint is applied. Um, there, this is the, the work that we have in our collection is a uh, lithograph. And it's very typical of uh, Ardon's ability to convey the sort of awe-inspiring nature of the land, but in very modern terms. Um, we're looking, I think, and again, lots of people have made lots of commentary about what this is, um, but it has been most, most often described as sky and land, mountains and clouds, depicted with bright, intense color, resulting in a composition that is expressive of inner mystery and the timelessness of the landscape. Now, people have commented that the, the lower portion of this uh, lithograph is everything from buildings to books. Um, I see both. Um, I do believe that it's, it's probably intended to be buildings, but, uh, and the sky, you know, to the morning star, not really sure if we can find the morning star, but um, you really get lost in this sky and in all of these shapes that uh, create the sky. And it's very, uh, very mystical. And I, I would say lyrical at the same time. Um, and, and as rich as the colors look, I, I don't know how they look on your screen, but it looks really rich on my screen. And in person, it's just um, dazzling uh, how, how this print just, you know, really explodes with color. So um, there was a break with Paris during the Second World War, of course, um, when it was occupied by the Germans. And of course, the trauma of the Holocaust and then the founding of the State of Israel in 1948 led to some significant changes for art in Israel. So we had the period at the very beginning from 1906 to 1929, then we had the school close and reopen in 1935. So from 35 to 48 is the next stage, which we sort of uh, consider the art of those emerging Israeli artists. And then we come to the post-war post period and that is what we what when we see the influx of a group called the New Horizons group, and this group was totally dedicated to really freeing our Israeli art from local associations, from you know, from anything that had sort of this pioneer feel to it to into the sphere, fully into the sphere of contemporary European art. So, you know, there are those who say that from this point on, you, you, maybe up to this point, you could sort of identify aspects that related it very closely to the Israeli landscape. But after this point, it really becomes just modern art and you, you have a hard time distinguishing what makes it Israeli or, 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 or Jewish for that matter. So that's a whole other debate, which um, I, won't, you know, I won't get into today. But in some cases, there are references to events and things that are happening in the world around them. And that is certainly the case in, the, in some of the work of um, the Romanian born artist, Marcel Janko. 
And this is a, a photograph of him. He was born in 1895 and died in 1984. And he was born to a wealthy family in Bucharest and he relocated to Zurich in his 20s and was active in developing the avant-garde Dada movement in reaction to the horrors and folly of war. So um, he's often called Janko Dada. And uh, there's the, actually a museum that bears that name um, that uh, in Israel that is uh, dedicated to his work. By the time he immigrated to Mandate Palestine in 1941, he had already participated in the transformative artistic movements of pre-Second World War Europe, including Cubism, of course, brought about by uh, Georges Braque and um, Pablo Picasso, and also German Expressionism, which was, um, again, somewhat abstract, but very rich in color, um, and that will impact him. He was very much challenged to respond to the declaration of the State of Israel in 1948 and to the fighting that occurred that year. But, um, and, and that's where we turn with um, this work, uh, which again does have very specific uh, application or relation to what was happening in the world around him. Uh, this is called Death of the Soldier. This is not one of the works that came to us, but it provides great background. It was the largest painting he ever, canvas he ever painted. It's five feet, five inches long by three feet, seven inches high. Um, and he derived his composition from a very famous work by Picasso, uh, which I show you here on the right. Uh, it's a little small. I hope you have your screen set so that you can see it as big as you possibly can. Um, but I wanted to get both pictures in the in the in the frame here. Um, he, so the the inspiration or or where he really borrowed or appropriated from was Picasso's Guernica, uh, and we see many of the elements of both of those work uh, of that work in Janko's interpretation. He sets aside the. Gray, the gray tonalities of Picasso's work for the blue that we all have come to associate with Israel. Of course, it's the color of the flag. Um, the, the, the color of the sky is a different blue in Israel than it is anywhere else. Um, so there's actually, even in the background here, the angles of uh, the triang triangles that are outlined in the background sort of uh, create an abstract Star of David. Um, and very reminiscent of the prostrate victim in Picasso's painting that you see here, the dead soldier in Janko's interpretation lies at the base of the paint of the canvas. But the figure here is is attired in something that's halfway between a burial shroud and the tunic of a Greek tragic hero. He is surrounded by his comrades in, in arms, by men and women bowed in grief or proclaiming their anguish to the heavens. Again, just as in Picasso's work, you have these you know, very, very uh, palpable uh, reactions to war. Uh, and, and, and he has certainly uh, built on that in his own interpretation of this death of the soldier. The scene is closed in from the rear by the walls of Jerusalem. So you can see the crenellated walls of the old city that are very recognizable here in the upper uh, third of the, the painting. The night is pierced by an illuminating ray of light. So um, in Picasso's version, it's a sun with a light bulb. And in Janko's version, it's a military searchlight. So, you know, he's very creatively 
taken this, you know, appropriated this very powerful anti-war message of the painting Guernica to his own purposes in response to the, um, the war for independence for Israel. So a much less fraught image and the one that came into our collection, oh, there it is, the full image again to get a better look at it. A much less fraught image, but equally abstract and expressionistic is this Negev Mountains that was made by uh, Janko in about, nine, Janko in about 1960. And um, he's applied the same principles of these very sort of jagged angular compositions to the local landscape. Um, he has had a huge impact on Israeli art. It actually continues today. There is still an active artist colony that he established in Ein Hod, a village in Northern Israel located at the foot of Mount Carmel. And that's where the Janko Dada Museum is. So um, I, someone asked if I gave this talk a few days ago for another group and someone asked if the, that museum ever opened because there were I guess, problems with it. And um, then COVID happened, but they also had fires that, that raged in the areas around Mount Carmel. So I looked it up and apparently it's open and thriving. So anybody gonna head over to Israel <laughs> anytime soon? Um, th this, this is probably a place I would wanna go um, someday. So um, next on the agenda is the artist Yassel Bergner who lived from 1920 to 2017. He was born in Warsaw and had reached Australia by the time he was 17 and emigrated to Israel in 1951. He settled first in Sfat and then he went to Tel Aviv. He did not uh, have any personal experience of the Holocaust, but he certainly knew what it meant to be a refugee. And a lot of his work is overshadowed by that experience. One of the things that was uh, an inspiration for him was surrealism. Um, and he, he sort of considered himself more of a lover of stories. So there are often narrative elements in his work. And when, when we talk about surrealism, one of the ways that I think it's easiest to explain it um, is like, is like when you have a dream and you recognize the people that are in the dream, but they're not where they belong. Like they're in your friend's house that never knew those people or, you know, something from your long ago memory where all these people that are part of your life now are interjected into that place that they could never have been. So everything's sort of out of context. And that's, that's one of the th ways that I like to define surrealism. Um, it's like, it, it really means super realism, but it also, um, it, it doesn't really look like that. It's more of the dream state that enters the work. So the work that is in our collection from this bot group of works that came to us and this is one of the ones we're gonna talk about a lot more during the Elul program, is this work called The Tea Drinkers. And it's a hand color lithograph, which means it's, it's printed using a mechanical process, but then hand colored after that process. And it's from 1966. And it's a perfect example of surrealism because what would these people, sitting around this lovely table with a white tablecloth. Like, you know, when I was a kid, I would say to my parents, are we going to that restaurant with the white tablecloths? Cause you know, that made it fancy. So here they are at this fancy, with this fancy table and their tea and their samovar. And they're in this jungle, you know, it's this very, very verdant landscape with, and, and they're in all their finery and, and just sitting there you know, and, and they're not engaging with each other or with us really. They're very blank faced. Their faces are very angular, very much influenced by cubism. They're wearing strange clothes. The little boy looks like he's wearing fish scales. 
um, the, the women are in sort of these jacquard prints. And who does that remind us of? It reminds us of Picasso and his figures of these sort of Harlequin uh, children. Um, and this is another work by uh, Marcel, by uh, Yassel Bergner, not part of our collection, but you know, again, that sort of odd fish scale, Harlequin, where, where is this child? Uh, why is he crying? Why, why this triangular hat on his head? You know, there are always a lot of questions, not always answered, but um, very much um, part of that surrealist ethic. So that work is, this is the artist who has two works that were given to us. And the second one is called um, Toys. He was very sort of preoccupied with ordinary domestic objects. He made a lot of paintings of things that were in the household, irons, dishes, oil lamps, and toys. And in this print, he depicts a variety of simple children's toys that are all sort of gathered together in this pyramid uh, of, uh, of a jumble of things. Uh, there's a hobby horse and there's a toy soldier on top of it. There's a clown figure beating a toy drum. There are lots of figures with clown hats. There's another figure with a hoop um, that, that children played with way back you know, in the 19th century, this was a toy, we would call it today a hula hoop, but you know, these were made of wood and they were, you know, very much a part of uh, the, the, the objects that children played with. So you have this sense of movement. There's not really any narrative. We don't know where this is or why it is, or, you know, there's no real people in this image, but just sort of this sense of this topsy-turvy dynamic movement that's intensified by the, the, the wheels of the toy and the very lively draftsmanship or drawing that the artist has brought to this, this piece. So um, it looks like a jumble of nothing until you really start investigating it and you pick out figures and objects and it becomes a little bit easier to understand. So next um, is a living artist. Uh, Dudu Gerstein, his name is David, but you often hear him, uh, the nickname Dudu. He was born in Jerusalem to parents who immigrated from Poland. He showed artistic talent from an early age. He studied at the Betzalel, which no longer is the School of Arts and Crafts. It's now the Betzalel Academy of Arts and Design. It is still in existence and considered one of the finest uh, art and design schools in the world. But he also studied in Paris at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and he also came to New York and studied at the Art Students League. So that's really kind of a trifecta of um, amazing educational experiences for this artist. He went back to Israel in 1960 and he began teaching at Betzalel and he stayed there as a senior lecturer until 1985. So in the 70s, he focused on figur figurative drawings, uh, particularly drawings and watercolors. And he did a lot of paintings of the interiors and of the seaside, where he sought to uh, make statements about human experience, human interaction. Um, and watercolor soon became his main medium. And he really wanted to sort of explore the placidness, the quiet of daily routine. And certainly he was inspired by Picasso's early work. Uh, if you look at the solidity of these figures in Picasso's early body of work, and you look at the, um, the solidity of this, this female figure uh, and the male figure in front of her, um, in their home, there's a piece of cake on the table. They don't seem engaged with each other or with the cake, but this was, you know, daily life for that, that uh, Dudu Gerstein was uh, sort of chronicling. So in the 80s, he turned to sculpture and he first worked in wood and aluminum. 
And in 1995, after years of wood cutting, he discovered the use of the laser and began cutting metals and painting them in shiny colors taken from the car industry. So if you Google him, you will go right to his com very commercial website where to this day, he is producing a line of work influenced by sports like marathon running, swimming, bicycling. Also, he does urban landscapes, nature, human figures like we saw uh, in the watercolor, but now he uses metal, three-dimensional uh, form to uh, create these stories. Sometimes it's, you know, vases of flowers, but they are very, very marketable, very commercial, and he has really, um, you know, made a career out of these works. You can't you go into galleries in Santa Fe, you'll see his work. You go into, you know, Israel, every gallery in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem has either his work or work of other people who are imitating him. So he's really figured out what sells. And um, this is really wh where his head is to this day. So the next artist uh, is Ivan Schwebel. And he was born in the United States, actually, um, in 1932. He died in 2011. He joined the United States Army during the Korean War. And when the war ended, he was sent to Japan as an information officer. That sounds pretty like much in the realm of espionage to me. It was there that he began painting and he actually was taught by a Zen master painter in Kyoto. Uh, and in 1963, after some study, art studies in New York, he ended up coming to Israel, immigrating to Israel, and he settled in the hills of Ein Karim, which is a village on the fringes of Jerusalem. He found a stone house in which he lived for the rest of his life. He he made a huge body of work. A lot of it related to Israeli themes and Jewish history. Uh, and he, in an interesting way, would bring together characters and narratives that were not from the same time, but had the same impact. And he would set them in modern day Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. He, sometimes it was in the Judean Hills around his home or in New York City. So one of the things he did, for instance, was to show David and Bathsheba next to a Nazi deportation train and Job despairing over his relationship with the Palestinians. So again, he would juxtapose ancient figures with uh, contemporary events. So this is kind of how it would play out. And in this case, the he views the Holocaust where you see uh, figures, you know, you see the, the Nazi soldier here, you see uh, figures being led away, uh, a whole line of, of, of Jews who are being expelled from where they live. And he juxtaposes that with the expulsion from Spain which were both terrible tragedies in, in the, for Jews in their time. So you see uh, Ferdinand and this is supposed to be Ferdinand and Isabella. And, uh, and, and we see the, the reference to uh, the kind of architecture that we, oh, that we identify with Spain. Um, and he jumbles all of this together to create this really response to, um, to both the Holocaust and to historical events. So he compresses them uh, on the canvas, the, these tragedies um, on the canvas. Now, that this is not the one that came to us, but this is, and this is the only oil in the group, um, that we received, as I said, everything else is on paper, either a watercolor or a lithograph. 
And the title of this is Winter 1973 Ein Karim. So it's in his home. It's oil on canvas, but also has pen and pencil. And um, it is very interesting because it's very enigm enigmatic. Like we really don't know what's happening here. And the date helps a little bit. This, this takes, this is painted just after, just a few months after the Yom Kippur War in 1973. So that might account for the enigmatic nature of it. This is definitely a self-portrait, but it's very interesting. He doesn't finish his, his face and his neck and his head, you know, it, and, and he really doesn't finish the body either. The shoes are just barely drawn in. We see one hand in, in the pocket, in his pants pocket, and I guess the other one in the other pocket, but what's going on over here? Like what, what is this whole construct? Is this a, is this a canvas on the wall that he's partly painted? Is this figure, what is she holding? Is that like a mop? Is she cleaning? Um, is this her reflection or are other people reflected over here? Or is this yet another canvas that he's working on that we're just seeing in the background? Nothing is really explained. We don't really have a sense of anything beyond the space that we're given, you know, this very narrow space that both of these figures occupy. So um, it's definitely appears unfinished and puzzling. So uh, this is the work that, uh, you know, we consider it kind of quirky, but uh, it, it, it's, it, there, there's lots of ways to enjoy it and, and think about what it might mean. So moving to the next artist, this is Manasha Kaddishman, who lived from 1932 to 2015. And he studied with several important Israeli sculptors in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And then he moved to London and stayed there until 1972. Um, his sculptures of the 60s were very minimalist in style and they always appear to defy gravity. So this is an example of his work called Hitromemut, which means uprising, it's in Tel Aviv. And it's either through very careful balance and construction or by using materials like glass and metal so that the metal appears unsupported. Um, this you know, is one of those pieces that you would always think it's never gonna stay in that position, it looks so tenuous. Um, and he was really most famous for these types of sculptures and also for very colorful paintings of sheep that he made. But he also did um, some abstract, uh, conceptually abstract work. And this is a screen print uh, called Mountain Bee that features neutral tones of brown, orange, and gray for the land and, and sky, which appear somewhat naturalistic, but your eye always goes to this disc, this black disc. Um, and in some versions of this work, it's bright orange. And what is it? You know, it, it, it punctuates an otherwise very tranquil landscape. And if we know that he did a lot of hard edged sculpture, it, it reminds us of that, but he places it in this, you know, landscape, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't fit. So what's the point? Um, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but it makes for an interesting conversation. So he eventually returned to Israel in 1972 and he lived in Tel Aviv and he earned the Israel prize in 1995, which is a really coveted uh, art prize. So he's, a, again, one of the major uh, important artists of the 20th century in Israel. So uh, Anna Tico uh, came to Jerusalem. She was born in 1894. She died in 1980. And you see her as a very young woman on the left and as a more mature woman on the right. She spent two years, she came to Jerusalem from Vienna. 
And she uh, was 16 when she came uh, to Vienna, uh, to Jerusalem. She spent two years in Damascus during the First World War while her husband served with the Austrian army. And when she first arrived in Israel, she brought with her from Vienna her memories of old masters whose work she would have seen at the Albertina Library. So she knew the work of Rembrandt, which I show here on the left. She knew the work of Hieronymus Bosch and his wonderful, crazy, detailed drawings of all kinds of flora and fauna and made up, um, you know, totally invented figures. Um, so she had that in her memory, and she became known for her beautiful landscape drawings of Jerusalem and its surrounding Judean hills. So this is the piece that um, is part of our collection now from among the 10 that came to us. And she focused on nature and the stony surface of the naked mountains. There was almost never a trace of human existence except for maybe a few secluded houses that sometimes appear in her work. Uh, she, had, she was very sensitive and perceptive to the land and continually renewed her interpretation of every hillside, the changing sky, every flower and thistle. So she lived in Jerusalem. Um, the Tico residence it was one of the first houses built in the city in the second half of the 19th century. And it was bequeathed to the Israel Museum several years ago, and it's now the Anna Tico Museum. And it's shown here in a work in our collection that we absorbed when we received the B'nai B'rith Klutznik National Jewish Museum's collection a few years back. And this is by a woman artist, Hava Intrator Barak, who was actually born in Kazakhstan during the Holocaust. And she studied drawing in Israel. She's a graduate of, uh, with a philosophy degree from Tel Aviv University. She ex is known for exploring pure light and its reflections, whether on a landscape or through a window into an interior space. And she uh, took advantage of being inside the Anatiko house in 1993, where she really uh, explored the shifting colors and light in the home of one of Israel's best known artists. Um, and this is how I, I thought this would be interesting to see. So this is the, the work by, in our collection, not by Anatiko, but of Anatiko's house. And here's how it looks now as um, the museum and the cafe are, you know, very popular place where people go to have uh, tea or coffee. So uh, these wonderful spaces with these archways and lots of you know light flowing in have been transformed. So another great spot uh, to visit. So the last artist that I'll talk about is the artist who became known as Shalom of Sfat. He was born in 1887 and he died in 1980. And he began to paint relatively late. He was about 55. Um, but by the time he was in his 70s, he was known as the foremost international representative of Israeli folk art or primitivist painting. So for more than 50 years before taking up art, he worked at a lot of different crafts, mainly as a watchmaker but also as a stonemason and a silversmith. He led a quiet and religious life and he came across painting accidentally and started to paint subjects close to his heart. The events from the Jewish Bible, uh, also uh, stories from the Talmud and other books. And he considered himself a historical writer and he was retelling the stories from Genesis and Exodus. And um, I put here side by side a work by Shalom of Svat and an interior of a synagogue in Svat so that you can see what was around him in his own environment with these very, very, uh, very crisp, highly outlined, detailed images, 
often with text or words that explained what they were. Uh, and he absorbed what was around him and his own interest in telling the story and making sure that we know we knew who the people were in the story. Uh, so that's why you will see text from the Bible that accompanies the, the figures. So in our uh, collection now, we have this work, uh, Jacob's Ladder. It's a color lith lithograph. It's from about 1965. And he, um, you know, again, in a very primitive way, he did not have an understanding or ability to create perspective. So the ladder, we know that they're going up <laughs> because they're away from us, their backs are to us, and they're coming down the ladder at, with their faces toward us. And we see, you know, very, it's very flat. These are the tents of the Israelites intended to be move, you know, some close to us, some far away. But how does he achieve that? By putting them on top of each other. Um, and we see Jacob, who looks like in any second now, he's going to slide right off the, off the painting because, you know, he doesn't really create a, a a space for him because he doesn't use perspective. I uh, doesn't know how to portray that, but uh, but nevertheless, we know the story because he's told it to us in in these little uh, little frames of information where he helps us to know what we're intended to be looking at. But what I what this always reminds me of to wrap things up is how it takes us really back, way back to the mosaic floors of the synagogues that were discovered all over the edges of what was the Roman Empire and the outer regions of the, uh, you know, of uh, Israel uh, that were part of the diaspora that, you know, after the destruction of the temple, synagogues started to emerge and they had art on the floors and on the walls. And this is the uh, artwork, the mosaic work from Beit Alpha Synagogue, which is from the sixth century. It's near Beit Sheyan in Israel. And again, just like with Shalom of Svat, the flattened figures, the vivid narrative, um, we are seeing here the Abraham sacrificing Isaac again, Yitzhak, Avraham, we know this is the, the ram, we know this is the tree, the hand of God, the angel interceding, uh, the, the, his um, men who are, you know, holding the animals, you know, it's all there, but it's described for us so that we don't make any mistakes about what we're seeing. So I always come back to this because it, these two works by Shalom of Sfat and the artists of this, uh, this synagogue floor were separated by thousands of years, but they have expressed their faith through their art, told their stories, and have made things of beauty that still speak to the generations that follow them. So um, I did want to just uh, let you know that um, the museum is open again. We opened in April. And if you're so inclined, uh, I just wanted to show you a quick view of what is currently on view. Um, one of our rabbinical students who just uh, was ordained and is now uh, already in Columbus, Georgia, where he is um, gonna be the rabbi of the synagogue there, for his senior project, he rebuilt a, a replica of a lost Polish synagogue from a town in Poland, uh, Sidra, Poland. He was able to access uh, blueprints and photographs from before 1942. And with the woodworking skill that he had, that his father had taught him, uh, he created a nonprofit. He raised the funds he needed to do the engineering to build a 20 foot arc that is now housed in the lobby of the Skirball Museum in Mayerson Hall. And it'll be there until the end of the calendar year. Um, and 
they, there are there's a lot of ancillary material that, in that space that um, explains the project. There's some video, and there's also a relationship to an 18th century arc that's part of our collection that's actually used every day by our students in the Scheuer Chapel, and that is also a Polish arc from 18th century, the 18th century that survived, and there are very, like, just a handful of them, because they were all, all of the synagogues were made of wood, and they were burned systematically by the Nazis during the war, so this is really something to see. It's, it's hard to appreciate it in pictures, but you can see how big it is when you see the figures on it. The student, his name is Shmuel Poland, did a service there uh, before he left campus. And um, we have a lot of great information about that. And then the other thing that we have going on right now is there's a small display uh, in honor of Jewish American Heritage Month, which is the month of May. It will be on view throughout the summer. We have, uh, we're, we're, we're spotlighting the Olympic swimmer Dara Torres. You may not know that she was Jewish, is Jewish, but she's the most awarded Olympian, uh, you know, sh so many medals. And um, she's doing, does work today uh, that's philanthropic around swimming. Uh, and we have a small display with the medal that was made uh, in 2020 when she was the Jewish American Hall of Fame uh, honoree. Uh, and so we have a little bit of a story about how that met, how the medal's made and about her biography. So those are two things that are special that are happening right now at the Skirball. And we're open on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I can put in the chat how you can uh, arrange to come because we are just doing by reservation still right now. So I'll stop sharing and uh, see if anybody has a question or a comment. And yeah. Abby. Yes. Uh, Henry Fenichel. When I lived in Israel as a child in the late 40s, early 50s, I lived next door to Ruben Rubin's house and and. Uh, uh, the museum that which really? is in today mm. that was his studio at the time. Yeah. One of his son, his son was a playmate. <laughs> and I have two pictures to show you. Oh, I want to see. <laughs> I think you told me that before, but I didn't get to see pictures. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my goodness. Yeah, same windows. Yeah. <laughs> same windows. Same windows, right? Same windows. Yeah, same view. Yeah. And of course, the what what is on display is Diana's last name in Hebrew. Oh, I made name. Oh, that's wonderful! I love it. it. My maiden name is Milgram, which means pomegranate, oh. which translates the Hebrew to Rimon. So we have a lot oh. of like pomegranate. I stuff. did not know. I I oh, okay. I did not know that. Oh yeah, that's a great, and see, that's how he always signed his name. Do you see the right. Hebrew Reuven and the English Reuben? Yeah, and that's right. a great, the Safrai Gallery was, is, is you know, was a re yeah, very that's reputable that's gallery that's that that's represented. That's yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Wonderful. That's such, back a, memories. such a treat. And that his studio is where he lived and worked, that he, that's still, um, an active again place that you can get his daughter-in-law is the curator that's we, right right we, get there, we usually stop in right yeah that's great thank you for sharing that and it's in the neighborhood in tel aviv which you might say is similar to over the rhine in cincinnati you uh -huh. know, it's really deteriorating but it's now the place to live <laughs> 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 it's called yalik street yeah, and it's near the old city hall. In Tel Aviv. Yeah, I, I've been there, and they actually there's actually one room where you go in, and it's like he just left ten minutes ago to go right. make a sandwich, and uh -huh. you know, like his the canvas is on the, you know, on the easel, and his paints are all there, and you know, you see a lot of other, you know, it, other work that he's working right. on, similarly to when you go to Cezanne's studio. Um, in uh, in um, Aix-en-Provence, you you know it's like 
like you just think that he's going to walk in in the next five minutes and sit back down and you're going to get to talk to him. It's like so, so cool. So when you, st when you, when you face the, the house on, from the street, the building on the left is the one that I lived in. I will remember that the next time. <laughs> we should be so, we should be. Our nameplate is no longer there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Henry, for sharing that and for showing us your, your paintings. Thank you so much, Abby. We're looking You're forward to, to, El, yeah, to the Elul, Elul presentation. Elul, 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 I promise you'll be doing more of the talking. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.